All right, we are live. Okay. I think it says it's setting up the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, everybody, just giving in a moment. Catch up to us. All right, we are live. All right, we are live. It always opens up on the back end. It creates this echo in the recording. I've been alert work around that. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining uh, me and Shasta today. We've got some really, really good stuff to be covering. Um, first, before we get going, though, I did put out a post yesterday saying I was going to go live and tell you guys about where the opioid research studies are being stored. Um, and I never got a chance to do that. So I'm going to recap that really fast for you guys, because I did tell you I was going to put that. Well, we did put an email blast out yesterday and a letter to the FDA asking for additional information regarding a public-private partnership between the FDA and an organization called ACTION, A-C-T-T-I-O-N, which is, I don't have it right in front of me, but the analgesic, anesthesia, addiction, translations, uh, blah, 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 innovations and studies, something like that. And they, this is an entity that is working with the FDA and has been working with the FDA since uh, 2002, when it used to be called Impact. And what they did is they created new research design recommendations and implementations and um, how you're supposed to translate the outcomes on opioid for opioid research in the nation to take place. Now, why doesn't any of the citizens know about that? That's a good question. And that's part of what we post. And what we found on this, um, on this organization's website and I'd like to actually, I would like to do a share screen really fast with everybody to show you what's out there. Um, but actually, you know, pause that. I'm not gonna be able to do that today, but I will, we're gonna go through their whole website in a subsequent video because I wanna show you what this organization does. We've already heard back from Action Representative, the director over there, um, their aunts, they were evasive and they did not answer our questions, uh, a little patronizing in the response. Um, and uh, we'll keep you updated as we as the information develops. But we have already started having these conversations already. This went out last night. They are housing a ton of the data related to the old research studies. You know, the stuff that has been happening to us and we weren't aware of. Well, it's housed over there. So what we are saying is we want access to the meetings, to the planning documents, because some of the work groups on this website, they give you the meetings, they give you the members, they give you all the transcripts, but then all of the ones that would be really relevant to the patients and to the people who represent people who need opioid access and are interested in this issue, all of them do not have any information because they don't want public to access it. Um, the answer I received from the director was extremely evasive and uh, did not answer a single one of our questions. So I kicked back to him. So what we're asking you guys to do is take the letter that we sent out in our email blast last night. It is um, also on our website. If you go under the accomplishments tab, underneath advocacy campaigns. I know it's really buried. We're working on cleaning up the uh, presentation on the website so you can find stuff easier. But in the meantime, that's where you're gonna find our letters. Take a copy of that letter. You just click on the link, copy the URL, and you email it to your representative, your senator, your lawmaker, uh, your Congress people, your governors, health and human services, the federal government, health, uh, human services, FDA, email anyone you want and tell them, I want your attention to this matter. This is a national issue related to research on opioid efficiency. We have a right to know who's doing it, what they're doing, what the outcomes are, not to have this like basically secret group of people working on it that we're not allowed to know what they're doing, who's working on it, what their outcomes are, what their plans are, and all we're supposed to do is sit back, trust them, and zip it. No. So we're working on a national campaign to have that information released. The public and the entities that represent them, like CIG, have a right to see that data so that we can see where it is going and know, is it working? Is it not working? And it's very clear, and I've said this in a ton of meetings, if the outcomes were good, they would be giving you the data because they would be bragging all over the place about their accomplishments. The outcomes are not good. And there are probably outcomes I guarantee that would be problematic with our civil liberties. And therefore they don't want to put them out there so people would call out violations of their civil liberties and their rights. So we are going to demand that information's released. And I'm 
anticipate it's going to be probably a little bit of a process to get them to do to comply because they're not going to want us to see this information because it is I guarantee going to have problems in there and they're not going to want that highlighted and they're not going to want to give us the ability to use that information to develop policy corrections that they don't want to give us. So that is what I was going to go over yesterday. I did have the plan to do the whole screen share and stuff, but I just didn't have time. I got really tired. Um, but today, Shasta brought something thousand times more important to the table that I really, really think we need to talk about as a community. So I'm going to hand it over to Shasta as soon as I find my screen again and let her take it over. So Shasta, take it away. Tell us what you got. Shasta? I'm here. Sorry. Okay. Bye, babe. I had to wish my husband off to work. Excuse oh. me, Miles, let mama sit down. Okay, so Lauren has been going through all this action stuff. Action was not something that I had ever looked into. Granted, I was familiar with the name. So I started getting curious into all the stuff she was digging through and I started digging through. And what it, what it caused was it caused me to end up back in my old files in my computer from years before I even met Lauren. No, I'm sorry, the year before I met Lauren. This PCOR, and in a lot of the stuff I would look at it at the time, I wasn't as educated on this subject as I am now. I had no idea what I was looking at. I had no idea that we were in a study, that they were doing these studies, but I knew something was wrong. That's why it's coming up now. It's old, but history is important. So mm -hmm. I want to do, I want to screen share my computer. Can you guys see that? Can you see my screen? See, I'm actually, I minimized you and I'm having trouble getting my screen back. So. Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? It says participants can see my screen. Oh yeah. So, I can, for some reason you're like minimized on my end. So I literally am not oh, okay. anything. So I'm just going to try to scare at the green light and hope they sure. the right part sure. of the <laughs> I'm going to bring you back in to do commentary after I give a little background. Yeah, yeah, you see that. And what we're doing got, here. Yeah, perfect. All right. So guys, here we go. This is the kind of stuff I had hidden in my computer. And always a story that will <laughs> of how I found this and what it was related to was the Pains Project. Somewhere in these action documents was a acronym and it was spelled out so I didn't recognize it. Well, it was the Pains acronym. So I pop popped it into my search and it led me to here. These are the studies that took place right before they released the guidelines when they were deciding on what to do, because this work dates back to like 2010, 2011. In some cases, a lot of it really started kicking up in 2012, which is really interesting because if you go and look at the archived videos of the meetings that took place in like 2017 and 18, when they would talk about opioids, they would they would acknowledge that prescribing in our nation actually started going down in 2012. They show that infamous graphic that we've all seen where it shows the crisis has been, you know, uh, announced by HHS. And all of a sudden you see this uptick in overdose deaths. That was the illicit fentanyl deaths. That was the, the polypharmacy deaths. They would call them pharmaceutical associated. Granted, they may have had a pill on board popping in their bloodstream, but it really wasn't somebody like you and I taking our medications as prescribed. They acknowledged in these old meetings that we were not the ones dying, but they had a problem because they had all these overdoses and they had to do quote unquote something. I do have this on video. Anyways, it leads me back to this document this was a stakeholder meeting, prioritizing comparative effectiveness research, questions for long-term use of opioids for chronic pain. So what happened is at PCORI, everybody got together before doing research. They wanted to identify what they wanted to look at. You know, they're not just going to go into the lab or in this case into our medical records and start going hog wild. They need a focus to study. This is one of the papers that was generated. It was actually a whole big meeting. If I can show you guys, um, let's see, which tab is it? These are the stakeholders listed. What's interesting, everyone in attendance here 
you've got Adria, Andrea Ferlin. Now she is this really mean lady. If you guys were around back in 2018 or 2019 at the FDA meeting where they had chronic pain patients there to talk about what had been happening, she was the one that got up at the end the very end of the meeting and basically admonished everybody for putting down the CDC guidelines and walked out of the room. She was the one that was handing out pieces of propaganda during the break, which I got my hands on a copy of it all the way out here in California with pictures of pill bottles, pushing the narrative that, you know, that, that the pills were causing this. So she's problematic. We also have at this meeting in attendance, Aaron Krebs. Aaron Krebs is the author of the Krebs study that went wild in the United States on every single front page of every newspaper in our nation that stated that Motrin and acetaminophen was uh, more effective than opiates. You want me to stop? I have one thing to say about that. Um, with national media, if you see something like the Krebs study in every single media outlet like that, it's coordinated. They put that out on purpose. They wanted that study to be seen in the forefront so that they could make that policy change. That was not in the media by accident in every single publication. And people need to realize that just like when they did um, the study back in 2018, that requantified the number of chronic pain patients down from 100 million to 50 million. And my first question was, where did the 50 million patients go? And all the researchers came in and bamboozled me with excuses and, and all that. But that was in the media overnight because it was, yeah. there is like a main communication channel between our federal offices and the mainstream media. So if there's any sort of message they want out to the public, they can do it instantaneously. It's not conspiracy. It's not, it, it's literally how they, how do you think they run the com the world? We need to be able to react fast, like to real time moments. The government mm -hmm. has the ability to do that. And mm -hmm. they do it all the time. So mm -hmm. I just want to get back to Shasta, but I want oh, to that's a great point. That people recognize she wasn't in the, yeah. media the place by accident. She was marketed and probably paid or they probably don't have to pay because of who they are. But uh, it was marketed and said. This is the new story that we want to, the public to see. We want the public to see this story and to change the perception that opioids and Tylenol is just as effective as opioids, therefore you don't need them, opioids. Right, right. Thank you, Lauren, that was an excellent point. I'm glad you, you got my attention there. What I really want you guys to see though, most important, we have Bob Twillman here and we have- Bob Twillman, the Pain Project. First. Right. And then people need to know that. I spoke to right. him in 2018 trying to get the Pains Project because uh, I forgot the name of the Integrative uh, American, whatever it was running back then. It was going out of business. It was going bankrupt. They, was the American Pain Society. Uh, they sold the Pains Project research or it was being liquidated in the bankruptcy is what I was being told. And I said, well, we would love access to that because that would give us so much information to be able to advocate for. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm not going to be given the Pains Project, but where did the Pains Project data go? The Pains Project is managed by a company called the Practical Center of Bioethics, who will save us a little story for another time. Yeah. Tried to pull up CIAG in the past to get us to, and control us and, and shut down our messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are the architects, the primary organizations that started all the stuff that's happening to us. So if you mm -hmm. want to say what organizations did this to us, practical they did. of, um, yeah, American Pain Society, Bob Twimmins group, um, Cindy Leyland's group, the American uh, Bio, uh, Practical Center for Bioethics, U.S. Pain, American Chronic Pain Association. These entities created all of these strategies previously to 2016 and then came out and told y'all, I don't know, I don't know. It's prop, it's prop, it's Kalani. It's the CDC, it's the CDC. Even though it's the FDA. That's why everybody right. says, why does the CDC have this? This is the FDA's authority. The FDA does have the authority. The FDA is working on it. That's why they're telling you to go look at the CDC because heaven forbid you learn and actually stop and advocate against what they're doing that would destroy their work because they would lose public support like that and they know it. And that's why they're so anti-CIG because we teach you guys what you need to know, which destroys their fraud. Because that's all I'm gonna say, what they're running right now is fraud. This is not 
appropriate. No, they uh, gaslit the American public into believing something that was untrue. Let's remind ourselves, what is gaslighting? It is to lie, to lie confidently, to isolate you from the truth. I want you guys to always remember that. One more thing I want to mention at this meeting, we have Anna Lemke. Now she is that hateful woman out of Stanford that is a proposition that uh, runs around talking about the Bravo protocol. She's the one that runs the narrative that we just pop pills and that's why we stay at home and are disabled because we're lazy and we don't want to engage in life. But right here, right here, you guys, Kalind Perry representing Pain Action Alliance to implement a national strategy. That is what the Pains Project stands for. All right. They were at this meeting. So let's go to the meeting. Let's let's uh, talk about there's all sorts of preparatory materials here I need to go through. There is an audio recording that I'm going to be listening to. Here's all the information that was linked. And the manuscript is. Um, these are the questions and here's the actual stakeholder workshop on pharmacologic treatment options and dosing strategies meeting summary. Now, I want you guys to also be aware it is referenced several times in here about the pathways to prevention meeting. I want to remind you the pathways to prevention meeting was when these again, stakeholders got together and they talked about releasing the CDC guidelines as a co-strategy to the national pain strategy, that they are complementary strategies meant to run side by side. You, the American public, have been gaslit into believing that the pain strategy just doesn't exist, that Lauren and Shasta are crazy, and that the CDC is to blame for everything. If you do put in the time and effort into looking at these documents, you will believe you will come to understand, not believe, you will come to understand beyond a reasonable doubt that these people are the problem mm -hmm. and that this was all exquisitely planned. So Lauren, I know you wanna go off on this. I'm gonna hand it back to you. Okay, so just going off on what you just said, mm -hmm. we say that it was exquisitely planned and they, they kept you from this information. We're talking about the people who sit on the online social communities, Twitter, and Facebook mostly, but they're on LinkedIn as well, um, where they told you people from Stanford University, people from the University of Alabama, rest in peace, Terry Lewis, who worked at the University of Pennsylvania and who was a pain researcher. These people lied to you and still lie to you to this day. Daily, they are on social media. Yeah, Kate you. Nicholson. Kate Nicholson. Andrea Anderson. Andrea Anderson. She, um, I don't know exactly what her role is, but she's very clearly uh, a mouthpiece for this work. And she has been uh, spreaded, spread some of the worst vitriol about us and um, has targeted this organization since day one. I didn't even know if the woman was. She's a recruiter for Stanford. It's clear. I don't know if she's paid to do that, what her exact name is, but online, her quote unquote role is clearly to recruit patients into studies and tell you and in order to do that, she keeps you dis uh, misinformed all the time. She tells constant misinformation. She runs uh, smear campaigns. Um, and mm -hmm. we have to actually approach Stanford University formally about this woman's behavior with cease and desist letters because mm -hmm. she does not leave us alone as an organization. And she is working in capacity as an advisor or possibly formally, I don't know, for Stanford University. So they have a responsibility for her behavior publicly especially since her behavior online is pretty much her work. She's not here as a patient advocate like us. She's here to do research, to recruit patients, to watch, to study. And she uses her time to disrupt grassroots advocacy from taking place because grassroots advocacy goes against the research projects being done at Stanford, which is clearly what she supports. And the thing is, she's allowed to support that. But she's not allowed to lie about it. She's not allowed to exploit people. She's not allowed to run different disinformation campaigns. Those are the things that she's not allowed to do and that she has done, and which is why we had to go to her, uh, to go to the president's office at Stanford University and mm -hmm. file complaints. And the president's office did disavow the behavior, but did they do anything about it? No. Well, did Jackie even meet with us about it? No. no. Beth Darnell? No. Because but in my opinion, they fully approve of her behavior online. And she can do it and they don't have to do it. So they look professional 
let her mm -hmm. be a professional, let her go with the patients. And mm -hmm. we are, you know, our parents is very clean and she does dirty work for us. Mm -hmm. it, I it do want it. Very reprehensible behavior. I do want everyone to also take note though, Lauren, and I think this is very worth mentioning. After, after that conversation with the president's office and the cease and desist letters were sent, uh, that horrific Twitter page defaming us, mm. mostly you, but us, yep. um, stealing uh, my well, video content, stealing our images, disappeared. Yeah, well, wait, it, it's it stayed up. It came down and then it went back up, but then they didn't use it. And that, but they really stopped using it after, because yeah. um, I actually commented, when it got taken down, I said, oh, look, I talked to Stanford and the page is gone. And then it went back up because it was like, that's oh, wait, right. that's too obvious. Let's put it back up because that's too obvious that we are behind. The yeah. Page, right. Yeah. Then they mm -hmm. put it back on and then they stopped using it. And then they when I went to uh, TikTok and started telling people, you know, the truth about everything that's happened to me. Page gone. You know, this is this is cancel culture. This is what they call the deep state. It's just mm -hmm. corporations, individuals who work within the federal government who abuse their power. That's all right. the state means. It's people who work in these positions that are abusing their power and shouldn't be allowed to do these things. So that's what we're working against. Um, Justin, do they're you They're unelected. Uh, Go ahead. They're unelected bureaucrats. What were you going to ask me, dear? All right. Uh, well, Shasta got a document today and I want us to yeah. share the screen, show that document, Shasta, and let's go through it because this All right. is unequivocal evidence. Like we've already known this. We've been teaching this for years, but what we need to show to the public is for you guys to see it as clear as day as us because you don't, you haven't read all the stuff as, as we do. So we're trying to filter the important stuff to you. This document in a nutshell proves without a shadow of a doubt Everything we've ever said, that it was planned, that these organizations and federal lawmakers knew exactly what they were doing. These are not unintended consequences. This is exactly what was supposed to happen. So let's pull it up. And this is a live uh, reaction because I've only seen one screenshot from this document. So we're going to read it together and you're going to get uh, a natural Lauren pop off, which nobody ever sees with Shasta, uh, about how I feel about these things and about how Shasta feels about these things. She, she read it already, but she's got plenty to say. So. Let's share a screen and read and see what this little bad boy has to say. It's I know, I know. We're going to paraphrase it. Um, but on the one screenshot she showed me, do I have so much to say? <laughs> so, Shasta, <laughs> do you want to open it and just kind of read? And then um, I do. And then we'll just comment. I'll put my hand up when I'm ready. Okay. To okay. Let's right. get it going. The overview on June 9th, 2015. PCORI brought together a wide range of stakeholder groups to identify, refine, and prioritize comparative effective research questions regarding long-term use of opioids for chronic pain. I'm not going to read every word. I'm going to skip. Yeah, I will make sure that we get this on our website so people can read every single word. We'll be here all afternoon if, if I read this yeah, word yeah. for Just word. Yeah, yeah. Just paraphrase. Um, the they, points. they do actually acknowledge right here that chronic pain affects more than 100 million Americans. Oh, um, it says that opioids are associated with a number of harms, blah, 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 blah. And then they give a list of the stakeholders, which I just shared and reviewed with all of you. It says that there were questions for discussion submitted by the participants and they were reviewed by two opioid panels. And so here's the morning session. Um, let's get to the good stuff. They, yeah. you know, this is all boring, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, just Category one. Category one, um, for patients with chronic pain, what are the two comparative benefits and harms of the following analgesic combination regimens? I don't think, oh, okay, comments included. The panel agreed, this is an important question. There was much discussion within the group about what constitutes a higher dose versus a lower dose, something which has really never been defined. They just took, you know, took it out of uh, David Taubin's backside to come up with the 90 MME, but really it's never been defined. Uh, the panel discussed whether underlying conditions, subpopulations, which ones should be defined, blah, blah, blah. That's not really that interesting. I didn't read this that closely. Yeah, I think what we want to do, let me, let me jump over here and because I'm pretty good at skimming um, to get us right to the point. Okay. So they basically made some, um, during the workshop, they talked about different things they wanted to do, like 
patient-centered, the impact uh, of certain diseases on, per on the health of individuals and the population as a whole. So they basically like wrote out things that they wanted to focus on and then wrote out their talking points. So under category one, they created something about pharmacological treatment options. And they said, one of the questions that were posed that stated that in patients with chronic pain, what is the comparative effectiveness of opioids versus non-opioid medications or compared to opioid outcomes related to pain, function, quality of life? So basically they wanted to say, what's the difference? What are your, uh, the effectiveness of these two in comparison? What have you found in your research is what they posed to Corey. Um, and they said for patients with chronic pain, the comparative benefits and harms of the following analgesic combination regimens, non-opioids, no opioids, so no opioids versus um, non-opioids with limited as needed access and non-opioids with, uh, with a daily dose of opioids up to 100 MME. The study design should include flexible drug and dosing options with defined parameters for each arm treatment to respond to targets. So this laid out the stuff that they're going to want to quantify, they don't have this. So they're saying these are the three types of study groups we're gonna create through population research. Um, and it said the comments added the, uh, they agreed that they didn't know what constitutes a higher dose, but Shasta just said. And that is, this is basically showing you the discussions before the CDC guidelines that they didn't know what a proper dose would be. And this is less than one year before the issuance of the guidelines. I would guarantee right now, while this report was being written, the guideline committee was being put together at the same time because you oh, yeah. have a year lag time between publication and committee. Yeah. So when this was published, the CDC has already brought together their committee to write the guidelines. And right here, they're acknowledging, we don't know oh. what a number dose is. So they're acknowledging that here. And that's what's important to show. One second, Shasta, let me just finish this section. The panel sure. proposed whether the underlying conditions or the type of pain should be identified, should be defined. So right here, they're trying to, they're laying out the structure for what they wanted studied, like what is a higher dose and what works between no opioids, like just nothing or non-opioids with some low dose or non-opioids with opioids. So they're laying out the types of study designs they want. The, and should we look at it by different disease types? Should we look at it by different populations, you know, racial, age groups, stuff like that? This is them writing out the study design. What were you mm -hmm. gonna say, Justin? Well, I was gonna say, as you were talking, um, they say right here that long-term clinical study of chronic pain, uh, they're talking about the registry. That's where they put all the data to study us. I wanna point out, they call it a registry. So if you ever see that word within all this information, that's a collection of data. And they cite two different registries, registries that they wanna model the pain one after. One of them was the diabetes registry. Another yeah. one is the cardiovascular. We've always said they're going to have guidelines and stuff about other diseases. Yes. So here's some evidence of that happening lifetime. Yeah, and we're seeing disease guidelines for sickle cell, for post-operative, for breast cancer, for everything, because what they're developing is called precision medicine, as in, you know, direct, you know, whatever's wrong with you, we're going to make sure you get the best care at the best time. That's what it's supposed to be. That's not what's happening <laughs> at all. Um, so this next section... Uh, a question that came up said for patients with chronic pain, what are the comparative benefits and harms? Oh, wait, sorry, that's what I just read. Uh, what is the long term benefit slash risk profile of opioids? So it's interesting. They want the risk. This is all about risk benefit analysis. This is why I'm also good at it. I used to do risk management, risk cost. It, uh, it's, it's a risk analysis. You look at the platform and you see what are the potential risks of this thing and mm -hmm. what are the harms of this thing. And if the risks and harms outweigh the benefits you don't pursue, but they don't in this case. So oh. I, what? Sorry. There's evidence that there is a correlation between overdose risk and dosage in uh, chronic opioid treatment for chronic pain. However, it is unknown whether these patients, whether in these patients, there is a parallel increase in efficacy with regard to pain, mood, and function as dose escalates. 
Is there a change in the risk benefit ratio with increasing opioid dose prescribed for chronic pain? They're telling you right here, Lauren, they don't know the answers to these. They want to find it. But what are we getting on the other end? They produce a guideline that says this is best practice. This is the truth. And they implement it and put it on us, force us to go through these things when they don't even know. There's your proof. This was written in 2015. Yeah. And this is what Shasta and I have been trying to um, educate people on for years. The public messaging from the pain advocacy organizations, the federal government, the media, the guidelines themselves say that they have this research and it has already been proven safe, efficient, and proper. When you look at all of the federal agency reports, they outline that this is the missing research. So what we did is we created a public campaign that this has been vetted and proven so that the doctors will adopt it and implement it in society, no questions asked, because it's proven safe. According to them, they've been told this is best practice. Opioids are bad. Like they think they're doing the right thing. They're being taught that. But in reality, when you go into the agent documents, these are all questions they wanted to find out. Now this gets very ugly. And I think I want to skip right <laughs> down to the ugly. That you asked Get to it, girl. Get to it. Is our ugly question. I know where it is. It's online. Let me go grab it. There we go. I think it's question number 25. Do you want the doc? I think I have it, but I, I, I can send it again. Yeah. I'm looking at the document, but I don't see question 25. You want to be in the submitted questions document. There was two documents. I'm not in the right one then. Um, well, why don't you read it? And then I'll comment because you have it in front okay. of you whole thing read patient i think it's number 25 right or yeah it is 25 but yeah. i don't have who, that document who are the patients with chronic pain who derive the greatest benefit and least harm from long-term use of opioids stop go ahead that statement what shasta is reading right now is something that was written in this document question 25 it's going to be up on our website ciaag.net mm -hmm. and this is clearly stating who are the patients who get the best, the most benefit with the least harms, okay? Most benefit, least harms, chronic pain patients, okay? So for years, they've been saying, there's not enough benefits to opioids. We don't have any evidence of benefits to opioids. They're only harmful. But right here, when you go behind the scenes, the truth is they know scientifically that they are the greatest benefit with the least harm profile in existence. Look up. <laughs> so this again, when you go behind the scenes to the agencies, you will see this gross conflict between public messaging, private discussion. And that organization I mentioned earlier, Action, A-C-T-T-I-O-N, go to their website, action.org. They are the ones that are bringing together the stakeholders to do these trials, to do the effective comparatives reviews. So it seems to me that they are filtering all the people and their, you know, people who support this work to do all the work. So you get a very controlled outcome. This is not proper science. This is more like Shasta called it a cottage industry within an industry where we have all of these players basically engaging in antitrust. Uh, violations, market rigging, misinformation, coordinated disinformation campaigns. Because when you go in the back of it, say right here, chronic pain patients are the ones who get the best benefit with the least risk. Let's target that community. Keep reading, Shasta. The next sentence, patients with chronic pain are the target. Outcome would be a measure of functional status, pain, absenteeism, or presentism for work. Are there unintended consequences for people with chronic pain being denied opioid prescriptions, including escalating suicidal ideation due to denial of prescriptions by healthcare professionals and or by pharmacies refusing to fill opioid prescriptions compared to opioid prescribing habits prior to changes in prescribing regulations meant to curb addiction and overdose deaths in the general public? All right. We're going to break that down sentence by sentence so you guys really take that in. Yes. They said, let me pull it up so it's right in front of me and I read it verbatim. Very good, because you're good at this. Yeah, this is, this is what I do. Like, I used to work in insurance, and I 
study contract language. I put together different parts of various contracts that don't normally belong together and don't catch people's eyes. This is my like talent. Forte. Um, yeah, forte. <laughs> we all have our special talents. That is one of mine. Um, oh, yes. What is this? Where is your, can you send me that screenshot? My God, I can't. Sure. Oh, sure. here it is. Never mind. I got okay. it. Sorry, guys. Okay. okay. So yeah, I don't have this document. You'll need to send it to me. You sent me the other one. Um, so on question 25, they ask, who are the patients with chronic pain that derive the greatest benefit and least harm from long-term opioids? Patients with chronic pain. They're, so that's, they defined their target community. The people with the best benefits and the least harms they targeted to do this work. So Crazy. they you knew you were benefiting greatly from this. And there weren't a lot of harms, but publicly they created a message that was the pure opposite, that there is no harm. We don't have proven benefits to this medication. First, it started at 100, then it went down to 90. Now it's down to 50. And well, if you can make it on 50 a day, then you don't need it at all. It's like the main goal is off, 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 off at all costs. We were at the RX concert. Uh, summit in 2019 before we got kicked out unceremoniously. Um, the first add-on session that they suddenly added to the schedule, which I know they did because of our meeting in Washington, they did yeah. a meeting about the difference between dependence and addiction. But one statement was said by that presenter that both of us caught on to. There will be a day where opioids are no longer an option. We need to find other ways to treat pain. So they told us that's the end game. Opioids are not meant to be an option for the public anymore. And it'll be very, very narrowly for certain types of things. And, you know, let's just call a spade a spade. The rich, the elite, the special, they won't end up, you know, do you think our politicians will have to abide by these rules? No. And that's what's so problematic too. Um, so going on, they, they say that we get the greatest benefit, the least harm, and therefore they're going to target us. And what they want to do is figure out, you know, our functional status of our pain, whether we go to work or not, and are we present when we're there? So it's like we have a superintendent, the government's like our superintendent, did you go to school today? Did you do a good job when you were there? It's like, okay, I do not need this type of oversight to go to work. Like, that's what my job's for. I don't need the federal government doing it too. But, you know, yeah. I get it. I can be a little sarcastic. I get it from a statistical standpoint. If people are missing work, they're sick, da, 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 da. but it's just kind of patronizing in, in writing. Um, and this is the part that really irks me. They asked, are there in unintended consequences for people with chronic pain as a result of being denied opioid prescriptions? So that was something they asked in 2015 before this happened. They said, are there going to be unintended consequences to this? Because we don't want that, supposedly. And that's what they're trying to imply. But isn't it interesting that as soon as this went out, the main messaging from every single researcher, organization, and federal government was, these are just unintended consequences. I don't know what to say to you. When it's, when it's known this well ahead that this is going to happen, that's not an unintended consequence. That's collateral, accepted collateral damage. And that you just can't say that because you are telling someone, I don't care that this is happening to you. I think the research is more important than your life. And your pain, your suffering, your ability to freedoms and everything that makes you a human and American. I don't care. And that is a hard pill to swallow. So they can't say that. So they had to soften the blow and say it was an unintended consequence to the greater good. We're so sorry. No, it was an intended outcome. They knew that this would happen and they acknowledged it. So let's even say for, for shits and giggles, it was an intended outcome, but they knew ahead of time that this could could create these problems. So they're acknowledging this could create those problems, including the types of problems they thought they anticipated this would create is increased and in escalating suicidal ideation due to being prescribed opioids. So when they say denial, denial. denial opioids cause suicide, they knew right here. Yeah, we think that's going to happen. And then it did happen. Did they do anything about it? No, they gave some money to Stefan Cortez to study it, who came out with an outcome of saying, oh, I don't know if there's any relation. Oh, oh, I have a question, Lauren. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This was written in 2015. So now, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not, somebody get the abacus. I need my abacus. How many years is that? 15, 16, 17, 
18, it's actually 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, eight years. Is my yes. math correct? Can you double check that for me, please? <laughs> These people have known all this time. Look at what I'm going through right now. I don't look very good. Oh, oh. I am not well. They knew and they continue to do it. And they this. continue it. Okay, so then they go on and say, you know, is there going to be escalating suicides because the pharmacy was refusing to fill prescriptions compared to prescribing habits before these changes? So they asked all this. This is what they wrote. Their intended outcome. That's what they wrote. Intended yes. outcome from this work. Right so this is what they wanted to happen. All right, you're listening. Mm -hmm. Identify the unintended consequences. So they said, roll out this policy and then see what problems pop out unintended consequences do they happen so that's what they said intended outcome is for that to take place so identify the unintended consequences of chronic pain patients being denied opioid medications so they planned ahead of time to deny this entire community access to opioids not because it was medically warranted because it was socially desirable and because they wanted to research what would happen to us when they did it. And then they said, after they identify the unintended consequences of patients not being able to get opioids and being denied, that would help the healthcare system and our lawmakers in developing a program that would allow chronic pain patients to continue their opioid medications or lead them through correct procedures to address withdrawal symptoms and reduce the possibility of suicidal ideation caused by escalated pain and sickness as a result of the withdrawal. So they're acknowledging that the withdrawal itself can make you suicidal and kill yourself. And they said right here, the intended outcome was to create a system to make sure that chronic pain patients continue to get access to opioids. Have they done that? Have they done no. anything to address the intended outcomes? They have not quantified no. it or they have quantified it and they haven't released it. Is it sitting in action right now? Good chance or PCORI, Stanford? Who's housing the information of these outcomes? Because they're there. We didn't do this type of work and not study it. It's studied. It's not good. They don't want the public to see it. And if the public sees it and understands that they'll rise up against it. So we can't have any of those things happen. We need no. to keep this information under the lid at all times. And anybody who challenges it, we need to try to smear campaign themselves out of the equation. And that's what's been going on for years now. So what you're seeing from, as we've always said, every single thing that you have seen has been preordained and carefully, carefully orchestrated by the individuals engaging in the work, which include our Stanford University people sitting on the online platforms pretending that their job is to help you get better pain care. No, their job is to implement these strategies, to study this research, to propose new research. Like our community is a free for all lab rat for them and a non and a never ending paycheck and grant money. There's no incentive to fix this. Just no. that to me, that's her talking point. I will make sure she gets credit for it. You, they don't have incentive. Like Stefan Cortez from University of Alabama, he did a study. And as far as I know, he's one of the only ones who's told the public. I'm sure these studies might have taken place with other people, but we don't know. We don't have access to it. We're not aware of um, that. He did a study on suicides, patient suicides. And then at the end, he comes up with this BS conclusion that he can't conclude anything. So I guess he needs more funding to do it again. Right. Because. He couldn't figure it out the first time. I wish I could just get a never ending paycheck for saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, give me my money, I'll do it again, I don't know. Yeah, I know. Um, you know. It's disgusting. And you know, this is what is so disgusting. And this is what we are fighting against. This is a coordinated campaign by the organizations that were supposed to help you. US Pain Foundation, American Crime Foundation, the International Association of Study of Pain, the Center of Practical Bioethics, there are dozens, hundreds of organizations actually at this point who have signed in onto this. They are healthy people champions. They are national pain strategy implementers. They do not advocate for you. They no. advocate 
for this. They advocate to get you to comply to this, to participate in the studies so that they can get the data and make themselves more and more and more money off of this and more mm -hmm. data. And they can rig the markets by knowing, by getting on the committee, making the medical recommendation, then getting the grant money, then buying the stock. The amount of market violations that can take place under this is unreal. We need such oversight. We need to have um, we need to have the FACA rules overhauled. That is the Federal Advisory Committee Act, because these committees are clearly stacked. We need to have the uh, public made aware of what's actually happening and be able to discuss it. You know, they're supposed to partner with the patients. All they've done is exploit and lie to the patients. Have you been told about any of this? Nope, not from anyone but CIG. That's why I say we are the only organization that does this. No other organization will tell you what is going on because they financially benefit from it. We don't financially benefit from this. I refuse to financially. You know how fast we could get funded if I just went along with this? <laughs> and I could have big funding in a minute. I won't do it. Right yeah, now, no, we won't. Shasta and I, people don't realize, we have been funding this company almost entirely this year between her and I bouncing back and forth each month. Can you pay this bill? Can you pay that bill? Because we're not getting donations anymore because people nope. think we don't need it or I don't know, but we do. And I would rather, and mind you, Shasta and I make disability. We do not have money to be throwing into this, but this is that important that I will do whatever I can to keep it alive. But my point is, we are in this for financial motive. If we were, I could get us money so fast. But I would corrupt yeah. my morals. I would corrupt why I created this organization. And I will not do that. Shasta will right. not do that. If I did it, she would walk away from me. And she yeah, would. I, would. I mean, I can't. I yeah. love you, but I can't. I know. And that's the thing. Yeah. If you did it, I would walk away too. I'd say, Shasta, this is not right. Well, this is not right. who we are. We yeah. are activists. What we are seeing take place is bureaucracy. These aren't advocates. These are organization coordinated strategies between the media, the federal lawmakers, the agencies, the pharmacological, uh, uh, the pharmacies, uh, not the pharmacies, um, pharmacy, the pharma, pharmacy uh, benefit pharma. managers, big pharma. I can't even say it right now. Big pharma. Um, they're a huge part of this work. You know, big pharma was a part of the national pain strategy. Oh yes, they were pitching it and 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 pitching it to the uh, nonprofits. I know that because I was told by one of the nonprofits who are leader, the uh, old, I won't name their name because I don't want to bring them out um, and without their permission. But one of the organizations, and I've actually spoken to several of the organizations that have been involved in this work that have now disavowed it because they realized they were exploited and lied to in the beginning. There, you will if you do some of this research, find some familiar names on there that. I have vetted and since changed their minds. There's others that I've also vetted and I have not called out, but they seem to still be doing this work. So there might be some shifting you even see at CIAG with our partners because we cannot continue to keep partners on our list if they don't make a clear decision. And we do have some partners that have been involved in this previous work and we know that and we've kind of asked them to make decisions and they haven't said that they want to leave us. But at the same time, we do need to make it clear if you're going to stay, you have to disavow this or you have to go. Because right. we're not going to walk the line. You're no. either with us or you're not. That's how advocacy right. works. It's not because, you know, trying to like be in charge or whatever. Those we're divisive. This isn't about being nice. This is about no. creating public health policy and helping millions of people that have been wrongfully exploited, lied to, and harmed by government policy that was created with the assistance of the very organizations that were supposed to represent you. And they didn't. They represented themselves. They did whatever they could to advance bureaucracy against you. I mean, think about this. U.S. Pain and these organizations understood that there was a there was a basic mandate and a national plan to withdraw opioid medication instead of advocating to protect you and to say you can't do this it's too far they said all right sign me up i'll get on iprcc and help implement and, and then when's I'll, that grant I'll, come I'll in my way into the support groups because they run their big support group and then i can advertise in the support group all the research studies and i can report on people's feelings and how they're feeling when the work group week to week and how the opioid withdrawal is impacting people by engaging them directly this is disgustingly exploitive 
You are pretending to help these people and you're really the one doing it to them. How is that even legal? How is that even legal for these scientists? You're not supposed to run a scientific study and engage the subjects. Shasta and I are doing a little research into, um, into how the researchers are using social media and what they have done to social media. Twitter is no longer social media. Twitter is a surveillance platform and they use it like there is more researchers and industry people on Twitter than patients. And that yeah. is so messed up. And we realize that because we get attacked. And then when we suddenly sent our letter to the president about the misinformation about the behavior online, it's been dead quiet ever since. Now, most likely people just saw that letter and said, Ooh, I don't want to be seen doing this and just stopped doing it because now it's been brought to the attention of someone that they don't want to be seen doing that in front of because that could affect massive funding for their entities. And they don't want to be seen doing this behavior. So now that it's been brought to enough of an attention, they ceased the behavior. So CIG has been able to work for whole six weeks undisturbed. Whole six weeks, in six years, whole six weeks without disturbance. And that's because we can finally talk to you guys. And we're gonna pursue this. As you've seen, we slammed out three campaigns. We're gonna keep going. Shasta's going through a horrible situation of forced taper right now. And she's still with us pushing, but we might slow down because of that. I've got to go through some health stuff soon too. So you might see a little lull, but we're gonna keep going. We've got huge, huge, huge plans. And you might see that, that lull and that we're not producing new stuff, but that's because we're pursuing this now. So we have three campaigns at CIG. One, I'm gonna, well, I'll let Shasta run her campaign and talk to you about it, but there's two that I've spun off with me because they're both our campaigns, they're CIG campaigns, but like right. I'm gonna take the lead on one and she's gonna take the lead on the other. So we split the work. That's what we see. That's what her and I do all day long. You do this, I do this, yeah. you do this, I do this. It's the way right. we get it done. And we have a third board member as well that is uh, not public who does a lot of stuff for us as well. Um, that's how we get all of this done. Very, very careful planning and conserving of the energy we do have. Um, right. So my campaigns that I've started have to do with, um, <clears throat> first one was the IRB waiver of informed consent. In 2017, the FDA issued a rule change that said they could waive or alter the requirement of informed consent for human clinical investigations, as long as it was deemed minimal risk. Well, that was in order to pave the way for this work to take place, because as we can see here in PCORI and all these documents, they needed to study the outcomes on the patient. And in order to do that, they had to get rid of some rules that said they weren't allowed to do these things. So basically, they just removed human rights so that they can do this. I mean, we've seen in Stanford University is infamous for advocating. They are still advocating for more human rights and more informed consent to be removed so they can openly investigate and uh, study you. I've actually recently found that that Stanford University is also staffing committees in the cyber liability area and arguing and, and finding loopholes with freedom of speech to shut down freedom of speech things. We have a lot of problems with Stanford University. My recommendation as a patient would no, go nowhere near that. They, yeah. are, they are dishonest. They're uh, very calculated. They're changing public health policy. And in my opinion, they're cherry picking data sets in order to do it as well. We're gonna be looking more and more and discussing more of something called antitrust. And antitrust is a very, very serious crime. And they're antitrust violations that have to do with monopoly building, unfair uh, business competitions. And what we see taking place here is very clear antitrust violations of cottage industries being created within an industry that is creating the rules, making the rules, getting the grants, spending the grants, creating the research. They're every step of the way with no oversight. Public doesn't even get to know it. I mean, they lock down their databases so we can't even see the outcomes. They won't report the outcomes. We've got over 51% of trials not reported to Congress, not reported to the uh, NIH, but we're still giving them new grant money how about you don't get new grant money till all your old trials are reported? How about there is no complaint mechanism at NIH for misconduct by their uh, grantees? Because when we had to deal with Stanford and their inappropriate employee contact, we did go to NIH. And there was other independent researchers that needed uh, to be addressed for their unethical and uh, mischievous behavior online of disinformation campaigns. And Nope, there's no oversight, no reporting, nothing. It's up to the institution to deal with it. Well, when you're giving that institution millions of dollars 
you should have a reporting mechanism too, to be aware of misconduct. So there is so much bureaucracy that we are dealing with and it is getting through those bureaucracy channels. Who is in charge of what? Finding out out, finding out what went wrong and then bringing it to them and pursuing it. And that's what we're doing now. If you guys take anything from us, you have to know these are not theories. I get people come up to me all the time. I want to deal with what's happening, not theories. No kidding. So do I. Everything online is the lies. It's propaganda. What we are showing you is the facts. So if you want your medicine back, if you want to get your rights back, stop dealing with misinformation, then start following our stuff. Start listening to it. Start reading it. Tell other people. When you see other people out there that are misinformed, that are really focused on the CDC guidelines, gently, and I do mean gently, because this is going to be difficult for people to switch and accept. I have been teaching this for years, and I see this psychological shift where people immediately get angry because they defend what they know, and they don't like to... Nobody wants to be disillusioned, and it's an it's upsetting process to go through to be disillusioned. Yeah. I got disillusioned through this process. Shasta got disillusioned through this process. I remember when I found um, Kate Nicholson's name involved in some of these, my eyes teared up, and I felt a level of betrayal because I spoke to this woman and asked her direct questions, and she lied, and she exploited me. And I was so angry and it wasn't like I, I had tears because there was just this disillusion and disgust. It was like this overwhelming, like just combination of emotions that I felt in realizing what was just done to me. Yeah. And how egregious it was. Um, Cause it wasn't like my feelings were hurt. It was more of yeah, no, no, no. judgment of what had been done. To betrayal. Me. Betrayal. betrayal betrayal of these people. you were gaslit and lied to gaslit lied to abused these people pretended they were better than me they told the public that i was crazy and it's like wow and turns out that literally you are the you're the opposition you're the one who did this to everyone you are the fraud you are the liar and you went after me and that is disgusting and that's why i don't have a problem saying their names because you know what they did these things <laughs> it's factual right people should know the type of people that represent these organizations i tell you guys exactly who i am shasta does too we're on video every day ramming down your throats exactly what we believe in because we believe in it these people won't do that because if they tell you what they actually believe in you would advocate against them in two seconds and they know it so they have to keep you you know uninformed and keep you in this like state of complacency where you do not advocate for yourself because if you advocate for yourself, you will take down their work. And that is literally the last thing they want to happen. Right. And you know, this, this letter by Picori just shows it. We're going to put it up on the website. It's going to show you that this is what they did. This isn't a, a theory. This isn't a possibility. This is what did happen. And this is what we are dealing with. And this is what we're combating now. These were planned outcomes. Like even that right there, it said that they were supposed to see what the identified consequences were. Uh, and then once they were identified, develop a policy for continued access to the patients or walk them through proper tapering. The only thing we've seen happen is being rammed through tapering. Where is the program to ensure proper access? That is now right. you can start posing. According to this right here, planning documents, you were supposed to X, Y, Z. It's been eight years. Where is it? That's something now we're going to advocate on. See, this is what we do, Shasta and I. We go into the old documents, yeah. guided okay. documents, and we just read them. And we read them. We read the meetings. We read the transcripts. And they very openly planned this. It only got quiet in 2016 on pun implementation because they didn't want the public to see it. But prior to that, this is everywhere. So we're going to publish this for you guys to see it. There's a lot more to the document than what we went through today. But question 25, in a nutshell, tells you, we know chronic pain patients get the best benefit and the least risk. We're going to target them to take them off next. Okay. Now, if that isn't a pure discrimination campaign, I really don't know what is. And one of the things yeah. that Ms. Nicholson, Ms., uh, I used to work for the Department of Justice, so I know the law and tells everybody what they can and cannot do. I spent years trying to defend 
the federal government from allegations of civil rights violations. She runs in there so fast to tell us how this doesn't violate our civil rights in any way, shape or form and to stop talking about it. That's because Ms. Oh, yeah. knows that this definitely does. And therefore, if the public starts discussing our civil rights about what they're doing to us, that we might actually win and they might start losing. And that is what their purpose online really is to keep you from having these types of discussions that would influence grassroots advocacy and would actually cause them to lose their funding and get you to get your damn rights back. That's what they do online. So when you see these little bloodsuckers sitting online, they are predators. And I'm not going to mince my words. To do what they are doing is highly predatory. It is cruel. It is highly calculated. And I firmly believe that they should be held accountable for the years of mis not mis disinformation coordinated campaigns they have ran on social media. And that includes Dr. Lawhorn, by the way because Dr. Lawhorn is uh, very well apprised to what's going on and denies publicly that he understands it and has oh, yeah. a way to discredit the truth. Paid News Network, when faced with violation of the nation and asked if he would, if he would, you know, talk to us about it. Nope. That he said it just looked like crazy conspiracy and, da, 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 and it was unsupported, has like literally pages of supported documents. It has been internationally published by the International Drug Policy Consortium. That is an NGO, non-governmental organization, that acts as like a liaison to the United Nations. They are the ones who create drug policy for the world. They ran our report because it's accurate. They published it. Our report is sitting right next to the Lancet Commission report. <laughs> you know, we want to talk about valid. It's valid. But did Red tell you that? No, Red went out there and told everybody it was it was conspiracy and keep focusing on that CDC at all. Oh, costs. oh, but then we wrote a crisis exploited and he publicly supported it and Until promoted it. Right. Just about it two minutes later and called and us just about it. Because yep. he yelled at, uh, he said, after I supported it, I started getting a series of emails from professionals uh, talking about your behavior and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what? And then when I tried to tell him the truth, he accused me of lying. He said that I'm not helping my case here and that he will consider supporting me as he watches my behavior going forward. Excuse me, Grandma, yeah, like a little girl or not my father. You are not my grandfather. And I'm sorry, I didn't care nor ask for your approval, sir. You injected it into me and tried to control our platform. Why? Because you think you're better than me? You're actually a very condescending person and cruel. And I've seen the email thread. So yeah, this, this is, is not a nice person. Um, you know, no. these and he knows exactly what's going on politically. He works and, and participates on hey, it. And hey, baby. the public that he doesn't know. So he's just as culpable as the rest of them. That's why you don't see CIG nor near these people. When everybody's always asking us, who's the bad guys? Who's the people who know? Researchers. I don't need to name them. They identify themselves. Red Lawhorn, Pain News Network, all of these people have been feeding you lies for years, calculated lies. Pain News Network gets funding. They get paid to run those surveys, to get data off of you, not to help you get your medicine back, but to gauge how you're feeling so they can do the strategy to keep pushing you off. Oh, yeah. And then whenever Lauren and I start making a little traction, they they oh. run their famous little story about uh, the community and why is the community so fragmented? Because you guys are fragmenting it. Yeah. Because there you're isn't. gaslighting everybody and you're lying. Yeah. And the community is not fragmented at all, actually. We not at all. Are all in sync. They are the research community trying to disrupt advocacy. So in reality, Correct. there is no there's no uh disruption in the pain community there's disruption to their their uh strategic exploitation what they want like that so they, they want to absorb it. us they want it they to don't want us. they've been trying us to, to exist CIG. yeah they've been trying to absorb cig since the day we got here practical pain uh the bioethics tried to do it a few years ago um we've had pediatric uh associate or the not the pain uh one of the pain societies 
I didn't remember the physician group that we met with there that tried to scam us and say, oh, we're the ones who get people on stages. And if you just join us and stop. That was bioethic. I'll get you on stages. Well, you know what? That was bioethic. That was bioethics. I will get myself Mm -hmm. on stages. Thank you very much. And I am not going to sell out my morals, ethics, and everything I ever did for a little bit of attention. So you all seriously underestimated my moral character and thought I could be bribed with very, very low level stuff. And I have- Oh, it's because they don't have character. Yeah, they don't have character and they, they jumped right at the opportunity. So why wouldn't Well, I wouldn't I? Well, because I have character. I have dignity. I don't want to exploit people. I came here for the right reasons. Therefore, I'm not going to. I have no interest in it. If I had to do that, I'd just leave. I wouldn't do this at all anymore because I'm not going to help implement something I don't believe in. And I don't believe know people is the appropriate way to do it. I don't believe mass tapering and discriminating against an entire group of people. is really the best thing for society. I think it's grossly uh, violating and it violates human rights, civil rights, you know, pretty much all of our rights. What yep. you oh, I was going to say, uh, you know, if the, the integrity and morals that you and I possess, and I've said this to you before many times, what really speaks to that is the fact that we've been together so long working under intense pressure. Oh yeah. We look at the, look at the, look at the um, composition of the other so-called pain groups out there. You see turnover, you see um, non-consistency in regards to the faces or the people, or even the fact if the group still exists or not, like you and I are a mainstay because we are based on that personal moral integrity that you and I both possess as human beings. That is why we are still here. Yep, exactly. And people are fraud. They're frauds. They are. And if they got money, I mean, if their money dried up, they'd be gone. You never see them again. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Like they oh, are yeah. here for that purpose only. And, you know, I'm here for a reason. I'm here to advocate. I'm here to do this. I'm here for a reason. If I didn't need to advocate, I wouldn't be here either. But the difference is, is I'm here to advocate. They're here to subjugate. <laughs> right. And They're- that's difference and we're honest we're trying to teach you guys we're trying to engage you they're trying to defraud you they're trying to keep you silent they're literally the ones who did this to you and then sit there and pretend they didn't know it is the most disgusting thing i've ever seen and for them to sit there and pretend that they don't understand these things and that you know they're the good guys it is the worst and most disgusting thing to watch people who are responsible for these opioid policies that we just showed you. There is no question about this. There isn't a theory. It's a fact. It's written right there in front of your face that this was all planned. And they knew that they were going to do this to us. And then they sat there, paid news network and the rest of them saying, gee, I don't know. Will you take this survey? Well, I get another big fat check so I can tell everybody that you're suffering. Yeah. And unintended consequences of suicide ideation and all of that are taking place, but we're not going to do crap about it. We're not going to run studies. And if we do, we're not going to publicize them. We're going to tell the public that these are unintended consequences. And once we figure out the research, we'll fix it. Oh, you mean once you finish experimenting on the general public to a sufficient level, maybe we'll get some medicine back for certain communities, possibly. No. This is what they did is a disgusting violation of human rights. And this goes way beyond opiates. People have to realize opiates is just one community. They are doing this work with Alzheimer's, with uh, various diseases, you know, sickle cell, IB, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Like they're doing these guidelines and studies. On Fibromyalgia, chronic that fatigue. They're going to all get it. Arthritis or uh, everything everything because it's precision medicine where they want to make precise medical steps step therapy basically for every single disease that is the most cost effective for the healthcare system not best for you cost effective that's important remember these policies aren't designed to help you they're designed to help they're designed to help financial burden of the healthcare system not your ability this research is designed financial benefits from changing your finance, your health care by treating go to work and things like by that treating the population not the individual they call it the uh, registry i've heard that term again from professional 
individuals I know, you treat your registry, not, not, the, patient. not the patient. It is population health based medical care that's not care, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so that's why they're going after all the self management stuff. As Think a or swim, get your ass back to work. That's all we care about. And as an old insurance you know? person, I can see like that, what that treat your registry, that's an insurance thing. They have you, tr it's your book of business. You look at your overall book of business to see how it performs. And then you get paid on your overall book. If you have a positive book of business that doesn't have a lot of losses, you make more money. So it's very much, that's an insurance um, tactic. And, you know, that's not surprising given that insurance is such a major driver of these policies because of the expense of healthcare, because of the expense of opioids with all the frivolous lawsuits they've brought forward trying to, you know, and that makes it interesting too. You know, when this statement right here from Picori says that opioids are the safest with the least things. So how are all these uh, pharmaceuticals being found guilty when y'all acknowledge that they are actually wicked safe? So it's like, are you seems to be abusing the judicial system too. Like with everything we have at CIG, we found a law firm to take this. This would be enormous for the citizenry. And what we need is a law firm willing and looking to do something like that. But I'm not putting my money in that. A lot of people say we need a law firm. Yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? I also need a million dollars. I need my health to get back. Like we can't advocate on the ideas of what if, we have to advocate with what we got. And by advocating, maybe one day that will happen. And when it happens, we take that opportunity up. All the stuff that we do at CIG, we focus on what we can do right now. And it is built on a long-term structure, but it's like, what can I do today that would make a difference? Even if it's just me and Shasta fixing up the website so that the website looks good so we can get some funding. It's all about small activities, one step at a time, so that we can take this and fix it. Because this was carefully executed against the public. And it's been eight years. There is no excuse to not fix it at this point. That's what we said, or I said, when me and Shasta were in the meeting in Washington in 2019. What I said about this issue when we asked for, cause they asked me, what is it that you want? Like, what is your ask out of this, out of the violation of a nation? I said, and I'm paraphrasing, but um, it was something to the effect that it would be irresponsible. Like I point out that you already have the research that people are getting hurt. You know that you have the ability to do an immediate press release. I pointed out the 50 million and how I know that you can do that. It's very clear. Please do so. And then we got the FDA announcement and subsequently the CDC. And then, you know, Kate Nicholson and Stephen Cortez and all the usuals ran in and said they did it. And they coordinated with the CDC a press release. So it's very clear that that was another, that was very insulting for CIG to do something so tremendous for the community and have these industry actors place themselves in the media and tell the media and the public that they were responsible for it. If it didn't, if it didn't come from us, that never would have happened. It was against what they wanted. They also needed, what it was, is was damage control to make sure that the public didn't know it was done by us because you'd get behind us at that point. They couldn't have that. So they had to put it under them and say, we did this. But in reality, we pointed out, we said to them, it's irresponsible at this juncture not to make a statement against forced tapering. You know it's hurting people. And they agreed with it. Thankfully, they did. And they did the statement. This is along the same lines. It has been eight years. You have the data. No more excuses. We want a safe supply. We're always hearing safe supply, safe supply, safe supply for addiction. Where's our safe supply? getting cut off. No more. This community needs representation. This community needs uh, a safe supply. And this community deserves to be fully integrated into the national work. No more lies. No more bullshit. And CIG is here to do it. And we are going to build a massive corporate coalition partnership until we get big enough to make this happen. And that's what we're going to do. And I hope like your participation as members is gonna make this happen sooner or later. If you participate, it'll happen sooner. If you watch, it's gonna take longer. And I actually just heard my little girl fall. So we've been on for a little while. She just got home, she went to the library right. crying. So I'm gonna to run to my Bella, cause she just- All right. Um, so thank right, you everyone for tuning in. And uh, Shasta, I'm sure I'll talk to you after this. And um, yeah. ask questions, ask questions, tell everybody, point them to our website, engage in the activities. We've got multiple calls to action. 
go to ciag.net under the accomplishments page, scroll to the thing that says advocacy campaigns, all right there. And we're gonna clean that up and make it easier to find. So bear with us. Um, hope you all have a good day and share this video, tell your friends, get it out there and help make us, help be a part of the change. Don't watch us, help us. Yeah. All right. Bye. Yeah, I can't close this. So I'm gonna responsible you to shut this down, Shasta. I can't seem to close my window. Bella.